today we are going to talk about gambling and other behavioral addictions. Uh, most of us are used to the idea of uh, addiction to substances, addiction to alcohol, addiction to drugs etcetera. Uh, but I am sure you heard of people being addicted to their work, you know, you have heard of terms like workaholism, you have heard of uh, now I am sure you would have read somewhere that uh, you know some people are more than a little fond of their Facebook pages, you know staying on Facebook or uh, you know more than a little fascinated by their cell phones. So, the issue is whether one can be addicted to a particular behavior. Now, how can you be addicted to a behavior? If I might show you the slide. Now, addiction to substances, addiction to patterns of behavior appear to be to lie on a continuum, because ultimately addiction is about loss of control. The, the, the badge of addiction is that there is a person has lost control over the use of a particular substance or over his particular behavior. So, while substance addictions involve abuse of and dependence upon chemicals such as alcohol, nicotine, uh, heroin, cocaine etcetera, behavioral addictions involve problem use, repetitive use uh, of potentially pleasurable or compulsive activities. I mean most of them are activities which are normally done in society. You know, they can be gambling, they can be sex, can be working, spending. Uh, you know, when you go to you know, people, people go on spending sprees, eating, etc. And sometimes, what happens is some people struggle with both types simultaneously. And often, and that is the point I'm going to try and make to you, is that it's the same people who are at risk for both types of addiction. Okay. General public often mistakenly view these addictions as moral flaws. In the same way that the general public often views people who use drugs and uh, alcohol as somehow morally weak, somehow uh, you know having uh, less control over uh, what they do and therefore, bad as less serious, but they also can uh, you know the general public also have a feeling that these are somehow less serious than. Uh, the substance addictions, the behavioral addictions I mean. Uh, but what is true and this is something that we see in our clinics is that these addictions to behaviors can also go totally out of control and they cause as much havoc on families, on persons themselves as drug addiction and alcoholism. Uh, and it often, I mean these addictions for example, gambling addiction etcetera often also contribute to a relapse to substance addictions when people have both. These potentially addictive behaviors are usually healthy essential activities, you know that is that is the paradox that most of them start out as often essential activities, eating is an essential activity, sex is an essential activity sometimes going and having a little uh, you know fun uh, is an essential activity. In today's life you know listening to the cell phone is, is has become an essential activity, but sometimes these essential activities spiral out of control. But one of the things and this is something that we talked earlier, these activities uh, all have one common property that they appear to stimulate a very ancient reward circuit in the brain. This is a circuit which as a part of evolution has, uh, has, has occurred in, in the human brain, which gives you a sense of reward when you perform a certain activity or more important when you anticipate performing a certain activity. You know first time you eat a chocolate, you get a warm feeling of reward in this particular circuit. The next time you see a chocolate, your brain goes wow just do it you know and this is a very important circuit as far as motivating humans to action is concerned and all these whether it is the substances whether it is some of these behaviors uh, that i'm going to talk about they cause a flood of this important chemical called dopamine in this particular circuit now brains are already programmed to encourage these behaviors by making them highly pleasurable. Okay. 
Addictive drugs and alcohol trigger a similar response, but drugs induce a pleasurable distraction simply by being taken. You do not have to do that activity. In this, you have to actually perform an activity and that is the only difference. Okay. So, what are the core elements of addiction seen in both substance and behavioral addictions? One as I told you is loss of control. Two is that you continue to do these despite negative consequences. You, you suffer pain, you suffer shame, you suffer loss, but you continue to do it despite uh, these odds and you make multiple attempts to stop, but despite that you relapse. Okay. Then tolerance, which means you require higher levels of a particular drug or in this case higher levels of that activity to give you the same buzz. The, the earlier level, for example, I start gambling, right? tomorrow I need to gamble at a higher level, I need to bet more to get the same buzz that you know I was getting initially. Then of course, there is this preoccupation, you know, it is it is a word which is often uh, uh, a word which is often used to describe this is salience, this is so salient that this becomes the most important thing in my life doing this activity and planning to do this activity takes over my 24 hours. You know, my going and buying stuff for my, uh, my uh, child has not become that important. My coming to work is not that important. Even when I come to work, my mind is con constantly thinking about this particular thing and that is salience. And if I do not do this particular activity, I get a sense of withdrawal, which can be sadness, which can be anxiety, which can be persistent thoughts about this, inability to sleep, you know basic difficulties and I get cravings or an urge to perform this particular activity and these are some of the seven criteria which are necessary uh, to signify that a behavior or use of a particular substance has become addictive. Okay, gambling, what is gambling? Gambling is putting something usually money at risk in the hope of gaining of something of greater value. Okay. Now, gambling is very, 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 very old in human societies and if one looks at the Rig Veda, which is one of the oldest uh, I, you know, pieces of literature known to mankind, uh, one finds that there is extensive de uh, description of gambling. And what they used to use is this particular five sided seed of a tree called the Vibhitaka. Okay. And this has been descri described in as, as one of the earliest forms of gambling. Then people started using somewhere in the Indo Iranian and Indian region the, the astragalus that is, but the, the uh, certain bones of animals which have different facets. So, when you throw them there is an equal chance of any side falling and this again is around 1500 BC, I mean the earliest signs. And then of course, you move to dice which could be made out of ceramic or stone etcetera. So, you have carved dice and those are pictures of some of the early dice which have been found especially in the Indian region. The gambler's lament which is in the Rig Veda is actually probably I am going to start with that, because it is one of the earliest descriptions of an addiction, a behavioral addiction. Just let us go through this, it says sprung from the tall trees on windy heights, these rollers meaning these dice transport me as they turn upon the table. The enlivening vibhitaka has pleased me like the draught of soma. So, somebody is actually making a, a comparison between gambling and the somras that they used to, uh, to get high on. And remember this is 1700 BC, okay. when I resolve I will not play with them, I will remain behind, when my friends depart to play and the brown dice thrown on the board have rattled like a fond girl, I seek the place of meeting. Meaning it draws me, it draws me this is presumably a man who is saying it draws me like a young girl draws me the dice draw me. So, he is talking of the craving and the, the urge and so on and so forth. Sorry. 
and these are these are for example uh, examples from pahari paintings the uh, of ga of people gambling you know the gamester seeks the gambling house and wonders his body all of i will i be lucky so and and it goes on and on about how one has no control and how dice are like you know as if they they have thorns and they can like goats which pull elephants then they can pull you so the point the reason why i i you know brought up this very old piece of literature is to just to tell you that this is something which has been recognized for many many years and yet in the country which probably described uh, pathological gambling for the first time we haven't had too much of serious discussion serious scholarship on pathological gambling okay it also talks about you know some of the consequences of of gambling that what happens to people that they lose everything that they lose their families they lose their wives okay all right let me go to the this is a very 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 well known scenario to all of us who've grown up in india and have listened to our grandmothers tell us the story of the mahabharat did you know for example that there are different forms of gambling there are gambling over sports for example these are people who are gambling over uh, cocks fighting with each other cock fighting and this is very very ancient has been described in some of the early uh, purans and uh, uh, you know certainly in the mahabharat on this side uh, is this picture of what used to go on in calcutta in the uh, late 1700s there was a form of gambling called rain gambling people would gamble on the amount of rain that would fall and when rain would fall people have gambled on uh, you know how much the cotton stocks would be in uh, the us which would be brought in by reuters telegraph and this was perceived i mean historically the reason why i'm telling you this is this was perceived by the british colonial government as something very very harmful very very morally bad and they tried to ban gambling but in in true colonial style they decided to ban gambling which the natives did and they decided that you know gambling on horse racing was not bad but it was legal because they did it and they came to this uh, very very uh, funny logic that gambling on horse racing actually is a scientific principle so you have to decide how the horse is going to run which horse how the horse uh, you know how strong the horse is etc but you know something that this is also something which is now currently used as a principle to determine what is right and what is wrong the law on gambling in india today is still based on this principle that if there is some scientific knowledge which is required then that is okay that is called gaming and if not if it's based only on chance then it is illegal because it is gambling anyway <coughs> so subsequently of course there are things which happened you know there is the game of satta which is illegal because it is based on chance but uh, there are two two uh, two two gambling uh, forms which are legal in india actually three one is horse racing which has come down from the british times the other one is a game of rummy and the third one is legal in only some states which are casinos where you you know play certain kinds of gambling games but these are some of the uh, recent papers that we have had on uh, you know gambling in india and what we've been trying to talk about is that some forms of gambling can be pathological like some forms of drinking can be pathological some forms of eating can be pathological and there is a segment of people who do gamble and they develop early problems okay basically what i'm trying to say 
is that there is a continuum of risk. It's not it's not a black and white thing. From no gambling to casual social gambling, you know, for example, it's very common in India uh, during Diwali, uh, during uh, Lakshmi Puja and other things to get to gamble in at least in some parts of the country, and it's part of the religious ritual. And uh, then, of course, you have serious social gambling where people disappear every uh, you know weekend to play you know some form of rummy or bridge or whatever and they lay, lay bets on it. Then you have harmful gambling, harmful involvement where people actually start losing money, start developing uh, you know go into debt because of it. And then you have pathological gambling, where gambling occurs to the extent of an addiction. Basically, we talk of and the reason I am speaking on gambling is that most of the work has been done on gambling. You have at risk gambling, which is gambling that carries the increased risk of developing into a gambling problem, but has not yet developed. Then there is problem gambling, gambling that disrupts or damages personal, family or recreational pursuits or next and most serious is gambling addiction or pathological gambling, which is persistent and recurrent uh, maladaptive gambling characterized by some of the following that I talked about. Remember the seven characteristics, preoccupation with gambling, the need to gamble with increasing amounts, inability to cut back or stop, chasing losses you know that I lost. So, I need to recoup the loss, lying about gambling, adverse social and financial consequences and continuing despite knowledge of harm. Okay. So, basically these are some of the criteria for pathological gambling, which I just already talked about. So, we do not need to get into the details of this and there are different uh, criteria depending on which part of the world you are in. This is the American uh, criteria and uh, earlier people in the psychiatric world considered gambling to be a problem of impulse. It was considered, considered a, 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 a disorder of impulse that you could not restrict your impulse. So, it was called an impulsive uh, impulse control disorder. For example, uh, you know you have heard of people who pull out their hair, it is called trichotillomania. So, this was classed in the same class as that, that I have an impulse to pull out, pull out my hair and I pull it out and gambling was considered an impulse. But now, people are more and more because of some of the science that, that has accrued over the last 10 years, people more and more are saying look this is like addiction. So, it is now being classified as an addictive disorder. Okay. So, anyway this was. So, how common is pathological gambling? Okay. We are talking about this and you are, you are at liberty to ask me why are you talking about this? Is it really common? What we do know is that pathological gambling occurs in about 30 to 60 percent and these are these are US figures of the population, you know, uh, but these are American figures. Let us look at and, and these are some of the tools which are used to, uh, to tap gambling, but one of the best screeners for gambling is just two questions. Have you ever felt the need to bet more and more money? Have you ever had to lie to people important to you about how much you gamble? Okay. And these are again some of the tools which are used. Let me give you some Indian figures. These are uh, figures of you know when we asked for gambling in, in the population in a population in Bangalore and we looked at people who were treatment seekers who were seeking treatment for addiction. What we found was uh, that in non treatment seekers sorry what am I looking at. Uh, in treatment seekers 13 percent had gambling of any kind and 7 percent had path pathological or addictive gambling. In non treatment seekers that is general population that we looked at about 5 percent had gambling of any kind and 0 percent had pathological gambling. We did an internet uh, survey of gambling and we found 
again about 20 percent people reported gambling of any kind and 0 percent reported pathological gambling. See one of the things that we arrived at as a conclusion is that people who were seeking treatment for other addictions were at much higher risk for pathological addiction as uh, pathological gambling or addictive gambling as well. Whereas, other forms of gambling the problem gambling and the social gambling were common in people who were not at all not at risk for other addictions. So, these the addictive forms seem to cluster together. The mode of gambling that we did find was more of uh, you know, sorry uh, of card games involving money uh, horse racing etcetera, but as you can see uh, no sorry this, this is a this is a slide about the mode of gambling. So, card games involving money seem to be the most common uh, form that we found in our the, on, in our study. Again this particular slide really shows uh, the, the kind of problems that were there and we if you, if you look the problems seem to be more in, in the blue blue strips which are people who are seeking treatment for, uh, for, for uh, addictive uh, disorders. But the slide I really want to show you is that problem gambling seem to be much more in people who had developed early onset addictive problems. And in a previous lecture that I had talked about you know how people with early onset addiction seem to be at much higher risk for a whole host of problems. Okay. <coughs> what we also found in this particular study is that the, the, these are the uh, externalizing scores, scores of uh, behavior which uh, which are name, uh, namely impulsivity, inattention, uh, oppositional behavior etcetera. So, people who had greater externalizing scores were more likely to be gambling than people who had lesser externalizing scores. Okay. And this is something that has been found consistently in uh, world literature that adolescents who have uh, attention deficit adolescents who have conduct problems are more likely to have gambling problems. Let me go past this. Uh, I will not spend too much time here other than to say that brain imaging studies in people with pathological gambling have shown that the, the brain sizes, the brain volumes uh, in people who have pathological gambling are different from people who do not have pathological gambling. Okay, let me go instead to because there is a lot okay so how does one treat pathological gambling currently the only method of treating pathological gambling are psychosocial interventions the ones which have strong evidence are cognitive behavioral therapies and uh, behavior therapies And very recently, uh, you know, we are we have started using certain pharmacological or drug uh, medi medical tre medicinal treatments for pathological gambling. Okay, let's talk about another uh, another form of behavioral addiction, internet addiction disorder. Now the question is: Is internet addiction really real? Okay, the the you do know of people who spend inordinate amounts of time on the net and who get very upset when they are dragged off or when uh, their internet pro, uh, provider or broadband uh, supply gets cut. So, do you think internet uh, addiction is real? Yeah. Okay, let us examine the uh, between 5 to 10 percent of web servers suffer from some form of dependency and this is from an American study. What is addiction? Like we said it is a compulsive need for and use of a habit forming substance 
but persistent compulsive use of a substance known to be harmful. Now, internet addiction can in involve excessive social networking, excessive online shopping, compulsive online gaming, excessive blogging, compulsive watching of internet videos and pornography and playing online games. So, when we one talks of internet addiction, one talks of a whole cluster of, of problems. Now, while there is a generation of internet addicts, most of them seem to be clustered in the, in the younger age group. Well, this only stands to reason, because people above the age of uh, 45 are not using the net so much and they are not as net savvy. So, there are some studies which show that too much internet usage can cause structural brain damage and some of the consequences of internet addiction are loss of a sense of time, that you go on being on the net without knowing how much time has passed, withdrawal when the computer is inaccessible, social isolation and fatigue, that you do not want to go into you know social groups and you get tired and bored very easily. Tolerance that is including the need for better computer equipment, that you keep upgrading your computer, you keep upgrading your software. So, these are some of the known consequences of internet addiction. Now, this is again another particular another study uh, on internet addiction and when people were asked do you normally stay online longer than you intended, 75 percent of people who were uh, approached said yes. Unfortunately, this particular study was done on people who were on the internet. So, <laughs> in, in a way it was biased to people who were on the internet for very long periods of time. When asked do you sometimes choose to spend more time on online than going out with others, uh, 41 percent said yes. Do you usually lose sleep due to late night logins, 50 percent said yes. Do you uh, think your job performance or productivity suffers because of the internet, 42 percent said yes. So, fairly large numbers uh, of people who are being polled are saying that internet usage is interfering with their day to day functioning. How often do you check your email for something else that you need to do, uh, 23 percent say frequently. So, is internet addiction a mental disorder? Now, actually the whole concept of internet addiction started off as a satirical uh, piece. Somebody wrote up a piece saying, uh, if this is addiction, internet you know sitting on the internet is also addiction and applied the principles of addiction to internet uh, things. So, it, it started off as a satirical piece uh, by uh, a gentleman called Goldberg uh, in 1995, but by 2013 this has now entered the bible of uh, psychiatric diagnosis. So, what started off as a joke uh, has been become a serious uh, pathological entity. People have there are some people who oppose it and they say that the relationship between depression and internet addiction is because people who are depressed tend to uh, not use, not to be in contact with other uh, people, but take recourse to the internet. And that um, it is usually people who are first unwell, who then spend more and more time with the internet. And that internet usage is secondary to other uh, mental disorders. But, you cannot escape the consequences, you know when, when uh, one talks of Facebook addiction, Facebook in, in 2012 had 1.06 billion uh, users, of them almost 680 million were according to one particular study addicted to Facebook. Uh, this is a US study and the time spent each month uh, was very, very high, it was about 53 billion minutes on, uh, on Facebook, 3.2 billion were pressing the like button and 30 million uh, uploads uh, happened in one particular month. These are, these are huge figures. Facebook addiction has increasingly become a real problem, because if you look at Facebook users and these are, these are data taken, taken from this particular study, which looked at Facebook usage. 41 percent are addicted to Facebook, 63 percent are stressed by delaying their responses to a friend's request, 
more than 30 percent, one third feel guilty about rejecting new friend requests. Okay. 20 percent people comment on their friends photos each day. Now, which pan do you guys fall into? Okay. 15 percent update their status each day. Can you imagine everybody is updating their status each day? Okay. Anyway, this is what we are talking about gaming addiction that it is not unusual for people to get so obsessed with online gaming that they forget to eat and this they, they just grow thin and anorexic. And it, it does happen and we have started getting people who are coming, coming to the clinic uh, with complaints, usually they do not complain, it is their parents and uh, you know relatives who complain that they have stopped doing every activity, they are just sitting on the net, they are playing, often they are playing these uh, multiplayer, uh, massive multiplayer online games uh, and they are on it in the daytime because all their friends in India are playing and they are awake at night because they are playing with people uh, in, in some other continent in some other time zone. A lot of work has been done in Korea where I believe uh, gaming addiction is very very uh, or gaming is very very popular and uh, apparently 70 percent uh, of the young people in Korea play online games and it has been estimated by two studies from Korea that 18 percent are online addicts, I mean game addicts. Now, people have often asked me that, you know, so what happens if people play games, you know, does it hurt anybody? And uh, these are some of the studies where you know, people have actually killed or hurt other people or hurt themselves when they were stopped from access to their computer or access to their games. Okay. Online gambling I was talking about earlier, so I will not talk about it now. Internet pornography addiction is also very, very uh, you know the figures are very, very high and uh, these are again these days you can get global statistics from the net and so if you look at Porn websites uh, of all the global sites, 12 percent of the websites are pornographic, and uh, there appear to be uh, huge amounts of money which are spent on these websites. These are terms which are used, especially in industry. Have you heard of cyber loafing and gold bricking? Cyber loafing is when employees use their company's internet uh, for non work related purposes during working hours and this in industry has become a very big drain on, uh, on, on the productive time and therefore on the money. And uh, so, people have been doing research on the impact of cyber loafing. So, there have been studies for and against, you know. Some studies have said that people who take time off from their work actually have better psychological uh, performance and better engagement with their work because they are able to take time off from their work. But I do not think the bosses in the industry are very happy about people using their computers to log on to Facebook. Gold breaking, on the other hand, is staff who use their work internet access for personal reasons while maintaining the appearance of working which can lead to inefficiency. So, you have one uh, screen opened which is your work thing and another screen opened on your Facebook page and uh, you keep shifting between the two. Uh, it has been estimated that almost 70 percent of businesses lose money and time uh, because of these particular practices. Now, this is not something that has become very popular in India, but especially in the US and in, in countries like Korea etcetera, uh, there is a strong move to bring about internet addiction rehabilitation. Uh, I have not heard of any such process uh, you know in India and honestly we, we really uh, we who are in the treatment uh, arena have not yet thought of developing. Uh, interventions, but we are going to need to develop such interventions. Let me leave you 
with these questions. Are you addicted to your smartphone? Do you have a smartphone? I am sure you do. So, are you addicted to it? 65 percent of iPhone users surveyed said, I cannot live without my phone. I 40 percent said, I would give up my morning coffee first. You know, I would rather you know check my phone before I check my you know have my morning coffee. 18 percent said, I will stop bathing every day before I give up my iPhone and 15 percent said, I would give up go a weekend without my iPhone, I would rather give up sex. Okay. So, iPhone usage also seems to be becoming fairly problematic. Now, the I want to finish with the point that you know we can keep adding you know iPhone usage this that, but at the end of the day what seems fairly apparent is that it is not the form of the addiction rather not the content of the addiction, but the form of the addiction. There are some people who lose control and these are people who are liable to lose control whether it is with cell phones or whether it is with alcohol or whether it is with drugs. And ultimately the issue is to look at the characteristics of the people who are likely to or who are at a greater risk of losing control and this is what we talked about yesterday. So, but I am not going to repeat that and intervention lies in dealing with these characteristics uh, which are likely to give rise to these addictive forms of behavior. I okay. will end there. Thank you. Can love will fall into this category of addiction? Love. Uh, how are you going to def define love? Like love for music. Oh, that is different. <laughs> what does fall into the category, I mean for example, is sexual addictions, because there are people who get addicted to a either pornography or to sex. Uh, as far as love is concerned, love, I mean if you, if you, if you are talking about love as in human relationships. Uh, well, I am sure there are some people who fall in and out of love, you know, uh, consistently, but I doubt whether uh, that would really, you know, be, be an addiction because, uh, but love to mu love for music, yes, I mean, f there are some people who will put on their headphones and listen to music all the time, especially the head banging music, uh, and uh, will not do anything else other than that. Uh, and I suppose, yes, it is linked to this whole thing of these are again people who seem to be at high risk for other uh, other problems. For example, it is fairly well known that people who listen to head banging music and keep listening to that music all the time are, pr are often very prone to developing problems with uh, drug usage. You know, and it is not about them being prone to drug usage or the music per se, but that these are people who often use this to control the hyperactivity in their brains as we talked about last uh, yesterday. Uh, sir, can we control uh, goal breaking and cyber loafing? Like one way would be to uh, just cut off the connections to important sites like Facebook and Twitter, but this could also be counterproductive because this can make them angry that they are not able to interact with other fellows and I think that this would also hamper the productivity of uh, the organization. Absolutely. It is a very good question, because there is no proper answer to that. Uh, it is like, it is the same difficulty that is there in organizations. Uh, for example, you have, uh, in, in most organizations you are not allowed to smoke inside, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. So, but organizations allow their workers to go outside and smoke. Mm -hmm. And then they face a problem, because you have people who are going out half the time, mm -hmm. you know every 5, 10 minutes they are going out and smoking. So, are you losing more time uh, by having allowing people to go out and have a smoke? You know? And if you do not, especially for people who are uh, addicted to smoking, uh, you will have workers there who are getting uh, very agitated and are un uh, unable to continue with their work. So, what do you do? So, a lot of age, uh, you know industry, uh, industry has now started uh, you know giving in-house uh, tobacco cessation programs, saying that let us put money in, in getting these people to give up smoking totally. 
Now, whether that will happen with uh, Twitter and uh, uh, Facebook, I don't know. But I'm sure people can be taught not to use Facebook and Twitter while on the job. You know, like most serious employees will not be sitting up and ringing up their friends and having, you know, ch uh, chatting away to glory, um, you know, while they are on a job, if they are, they are, they are serious about their job. But you are right, I mean, if you prevent forcibly, if you cut off Twitter accounts, which some companies do, that you have no access to uh, the internet other than the sites that you have to visit, because you are on a company intranet or whatever. Uh, whether that creates more satisfied em employees or more disgruntled employees, that is something that we really don't know about. Nobody has really done any work about that, but it's a good question. Uh, we talked about how <coughs> internet addiction was a consequence of depression, where they went into the internet addiction to get away from depression. So does it ever get to a point where you finally get bored of it? Of the internet? Yeah, by, where you are so much into it, you, you feel you have explored everything. Well, I know of lots of people who unfriend themselves uh, from the Facebook, from Facebook. But uh, people who are really, really addicted, mm -hmm. and they get up one day and say that I'm not going to use the internet any longer. I'm sure there are. Like there are people who are really, really addicted to alcohol, and one day say I'm not going to drink anymore. But statistically, uh, I would say that I would, I would hazard a guess because there's, there's not any raw hard data about it, but I hazard a guess that they are few and far between. Because remember, when we are talking of addiction, what we, are what we are slowly understanding is that some people are getting addicted because of certain ways of brain functioning. And these are people who are liable to get addicted whether to this or to that. In fact, it is a well known phenomenon that in, in places like the AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, where people have come to give up alcohol, there is a huge amount of smoke. And there is this whole concept of shifting from one addiction to another, replacing one addiction with another. So the real solution probably is to get people to shift to addictions which are adaptive, healthier addictions, safer addictions. So, is there any difference in the extroverts and introverts when yeah. it comes to vulnerability to uh, like internet addiction and all? Well, that has not been studied, but again I would hazard a guess that people with this impulsivity, inattention, etc. are more likely uh, to be attached to any addictive behavior than uh, people who are not. But to your direct question whether there is a difference between extroverts and introverts, there is no hard data, there, nobody has really studied it. Uh, please remember that these are concepts which are very, very new. Most of the world does not believe that these concepts exist. And these concepts have come up and are being put up saying that let us study this and see whether we really need to, to get bothered about it, we really need to, uh, to follow this up. But as all of you know that uh, all of you can at least count five people who sit on the internet uh, among your friends, who sit on the internet more than they require to, who have cut down their social interaction because of their love for the, uh, you know, for, for surfing whatever sites they surf. And uh, so to all of you, it is a real problem. In some, at least five people you know. Yeah. Similarly, with cell phones, or oh no, not so much with cell phones. Mm -hmm. Not, not yet. Okay. And so, uh, one more question: What about social voyeurism? Is it can that also fall into? What does that mean? Social voyeurism, mean? as in uh, people who are like they want to know about the peop uh, lives of other people who are on their Facebook friend list or something like that, mm -hmm. but they don't want to tell about their life. So they keep 
their life is a secret their own for photographs their own post status updates anything but they have that urge to know what is happening in other people's lives uh, regularly yeah. check uh, their profile and all that so what, what is the term used for it mm, i heard skulking on the internet social voyeurism yeah okay. <laughs> yeah so I, i suppose no but then that is uh, that is there in normal human intervention also no i mean yeah. of the, the the number of people who are here who are asking questions there'll be one or two who will not ask questions who will be very keenly listening to the other people asking questions who will be very keenly observing what is happening you know so but you know to be fair there are some people who will you know be hidden and keep watching uh, and uh, like you're saying voyeurism looking at some of the things which uh, which are which are not very necessarily very adaptive mm. there will be i mean and and if you go to s- certain sites you find that there are people who go to uh, social media sites pick up pictures yeah. and uh, and then they collect them and use it for not so healthy purposes mm. and and yes that is there that is the very nature of the internet that if you choose to you can be uh, you know stay hidden and so what are the methods which are being currently employed by uh, the us society uh, to curb the internet addiction St- there are certain sites not just us i mean uh, it's there in australia and uh, various other ca- uh, ca- countries which are looking at providing services for uh, internet and other addictions ga- gambling addiction etc uh, which is similar to like i i showed you some of the things uh, most of it is behavioral treatments basically uh most of these behavioral treatments try to uh, get you to unlearn old patterns of behavior and learn newer and more adaptive patterns of behavior uh so uh, it uses a behavioral therapy model or a cognitive behavior therapy model cognitive behavior therapy also includes looking at the cognitions or thoughts the, the the automatic cognitions and thoughts which one falls into uh and which then propels your behavior you know the shoulds and woulds that one has in your w- one's mind isn't it and sir does this also change the wiring of brain like earlier uh, in the yesterday's talk you mentioned that uh, when one is too addicted too much addicted to drugs or say alcohol uh, the wiring the hardwiring of brain changes yes so does similar thing happens in this abuse also like when you are one is uh, too much addicted to say internet or gambling does the wiring of brain changes here yeah. also there is very early data very early data which shows that there is difference between the brains of people who are addicted to some of these behavioral addictions mostly gambling and people who are not now the same question that we talked about yesterday is whether these changes are there before or are a consequence of this behavior that is something which we still can't answer but from the experience of uh, of what we have learned from from substance gambling and uh, sorry substance use disorder substance addiction one would hazard a guess that these pr- uh, these differences in the brain uh, size brain function existed you know before people took on the the behavioral uh, you know became behaviorally addicted so that that it is a vulnerability rather than just a uh, consequence of this particular behavioral addiction Anything? If someone wants to quit one kind of addiction, so is it that they are more prone to fall for other right. kind of addictions? They, they, uh, yes, you are absolutely right. That uh, if one quits one kind of addiction, you are also prone to developing other addictions. So, the ultimate aim will be to try and uh, deal with the the basic vulnerability that exists. Uh, rather than just getting people to quit one addiction or the other unfortunately our old way of dealing with addiction has been to say stop this mm-hmm. okay it has not been to say stop this and i shall also provide you with a solution to deal with whatever is causing you to get addict so the treatment of addiction has been like a revolving door you go in go out from the door and you come back again through the door 
Now, recent strategies which have, uh, which we have started looking at, have started looking at, let us deal with the pre-existing problem, rather than just looking at the tip of the iceberg. It is like an iceberg, mm -hmm. you know, only a small part is visible. But if you only look at that, your ship gets sunk by what is under the water. A small question to ask. Uh, is it that uh, you first become addicted to one type of this, which would ultimately lead you to some other consequence? Like say, uh, if I am into <coughs> online gaming or if I am into pornography, then is it that uh, you know, first I develop addiction towards internet? And then that addiction further gets the flavor of, uh, say, internet gaming or pornographic material. Okay, what you're talking about is this whole concept of gateway addiction, uh, which is specifically used in uh, drug use. That the, the the classical thing is that you start on tobacco, smoking or chewing, and that leads you on to other other drugs. Or, uh, as was earlier thought, that people who start using cannabis, ganja. Uh, that is the gateway to lead you into others, uh, you know, s more serious drugs like heroin and uh, you know cocaine and other other uh, substances. That has proved to be not very useful model to follow. Similarly, I wouldn't really subscribe to gateway addiction even in the behavioral addictions, because I would think that what one chooses as uh, the behavior is dependent on your circumstance. If you have access to gambling, you go to that. If you have access to the internet, you go to that. And uh, it is because of your, uh, the fact that whatever this particular thing <coughs> increases uh, activity in your reward circuit, you persist with that. And because in a way it deals with this particular vulnerability and normalizes this uh, externalizing uh, behavior that you continue with that because like I showed yesterday it seems to give you a better response a better reinforcement than it gives other 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 people I mean the people who are uh, vulnerable and so you continue and you persist with that and it could be whatever you started on the issue is that sometimes when you stop one and you have not dealt with your vulnerability, then you have to move on to another subst uh, another substance or another behavior. The, the lesson being that one who is vulnerable is vulnerable to any or many of uh, these behaviors or substances.